final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 9923 in the name of Margaret McCulloch and the future of DFID in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I'd invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible, please. And so I call on Margaret McCulloch to open the debate. Seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, President Officer. The Parliament is at its most united when showing solidarity with parts of the world in poverty or distress. Nobody here could or should try to monopolise concern for the world's poorest. It's something we all share. Whatever the outcome of next month's referendum, the challenge of poverty in the world will still be with us, and people of conviction and good conscience will keep on working, keep on fighting, and keep on campaigning until the day it's not. The purpose of my motion is not to snatch the moral high ground as part of a wider referendum debate, nor is it a blanket endorsement of the aid policies of the present UK Government, or even the last one. It's to make sure that Parliament doesn't adjourn tomorrow without hearing the implications a decision we might make next month could have in our international aid effort and the people tasked with delivering it. Presiding officer, DFID East Cobride Office at Abercrombie House supports a total workforce of 600, of which around 550 are UK-based home civil servants. That's 43 per cent, almost half the total number of civil servants working for DFID in the UK. East Cobride is home to the department's second headquarters, responsible for policy and research, supporting regional programmes for Africa and Asia, and leading in government priorities like tackling hunger and malnutrition. Half of UK aid is now delivered through DFID in East Cobride. Even the establishment of the International Development Fund in this Parliament was informed by specialists in DFID, an example of what the best of both worlds means in practice. In the event of a yes vote, DFID would review its presence in Scotland, and the Secretary of State is on record as saying there's no logical reason why it would remain. The International Development Select Committee expect the East Office which contributes £30 million to the local economy, to close within five years of a yes vote. East Cobride staff, many of them invaluable, specialist, high-quality jobs, could face relocation or redundancy, and there is little to substantiate that assurances to the contrary. And, uh, no, I've got to, I don't have time. And also, any of your questions you should have actually asked in your white paper. The International Development Agency which expect the East Cobride Office, which contributes £30 million to the local economy, is to close within five years of a yes vote. And, as I says, East Cobride-based staff, many of them invaluable, specialist, high-quality jobs, could face relocation or redundancy. In evidence to the committee, the Minister, Humza Yousaf, guaranteed there will be ample opportunity for staff currently based at Abercrombie House to continue employment either with a UK government retaining a base in East Cobride or with the Scottish Government. That isn't much of a guarantee, and I'll explain why. Firstly, the idea that DFID would continue to run half of its aid programme out of a foreign country is, as one of its top former civil servants, David Fisher, says, simply not credible. There are examples of countries which pull expertise. There are DFID staff working with multilateral agencies in places like Geneva and New York, but there is no precedent for the UK employing almost half a department of home civil servants in a single foreign country. Secondly, the headquarters of an independent Scottish development agency would require fewer staff than the 550 civil servants currently employed at Abercrombie House. At 8.3 per cent, our population share – no, you've had opportunities in the white paper – our population share of DFID's 1,300 UK-based civil servants. Presiding officer, we ask them to be quiet while I finish, please. Comes to around 110. This is more in line with the staff and figures provided to the External Affairs Committee by the ECDPM for small independent countries such as Ireland. If the remaining workers are to be offered jobs elsewhere in the Scottish Government, then what will those jobs be? What will they pay? At what grade? And where will they be based? 
Does the Minister dispute the figures I've just given? And if, he's, if so, can he tell us later on this evening how many people will be employed in the Scottish Aid Agency? Let me finish. And why none of this has been set out or costed in the white paper? Or is the Minister really suggesting that an independent Scotland would still need 43% of DFID staff to spend 8.3% of the budget? And you can answer that when you're winding up. With a month to go until the referendum, the future of civil servants in my region remains clear, unclear and that uncertainty is unacceptable. Thanks to the work of DFID, the UK is now widely regarded as a global leader in development and it has cemented its position as the world's second, second biggest aid donor. The commitment to development index often cited by the Scottish Government, makes a balanced critique of the UK aid, but it also places the UK in the top third of their rankings and sets out some of our key strengths. High net income, no tied aid, financial transparency. Last year, the UK... No, sit down. Last year, the UK became the first of the G8 nations to meet the 0.7% aid to national income tar target. You have never answered our questions, we will not answer yours. With the current government completing a journey started by the last, there is even a consensus in support of enshrining that target in law. The White Paper makes some welcome statements about overseas development, even if there are only three pages on the subject, but it glosses over important facts. If Scotland were to become independent, DFID's budget would be expected to fall by £1 billion, and it is far from clear how Scotland and the UK would manage the transition period and minimise impact on existing aid commitments. Not only would a new independent aid agency face set-up and administration costs, but so too would a restructured DFID. The costs of fragmentation and duplication would inevitably eat into frontline aid spending. And of course, it doesn't have to be that way. As part of the UK, we pool and share our resources and we can use our global reach, our influence and our combined wealth to shape the world around us. As the second largest aid donor on the planet, we have a powerful voice in the world, which we use best when making rich countries confront poverty and sustainability. The creation of DFID, the growth in the aid budget, our emergence as a global leader in the development. None of it would be possible without the combined efforts of public servants working in Scotland, London and around the world. What we have achieved, we have achieved together. That surely is a positive, progressive, humanitarian reason for continued union between Scotland and the UK. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we now move to the open debate, and I call on Linda Fabiani to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Four minutes, so thereby, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, normally, in a member's debate, I would uh, thank the member for laying the motion, and I would have supported the motion. I couldn't do that, uh, because there are things that are very, very wrong with this. There's two issues, particularly, that uh, I think are completely erroneous in this motion. One is about the job losses. Uh, in East Kilbride, my constituency, and the other is about the fragmentation of aid spending. And I'll go on to say more about these. There has been an ongoing campaign by Better Together in East Kilbride. It's been going on for about a couple of years now, um, telling civil servants, both in HMRC based there, but particularly in DFID, that their jobs will go if they vote yes. It's shameful scaremongering. Yeah. And it has been going on for a long, long time. I think it's abhorrent to be scaring people like that. It's on a par with what came out today uh, to the DWP civil servants from the, the chief civil servant. And let me tell you why, because it's made very, very clear. And when this government makes things clear, they tend to carry them through. And I think our record stands on that. The Scottish Government will offer con continuity of employment and has a no compulsory redundancy policy in place. That's more than the UK Government has. And let's face it, Labour and Tory UK Governments have cut civil service jobs all across Scotland. So the real threat to different jobs in East Kilbride 
is a no vote. Absolutely. The UK Government has been committed to cutting jobs in DFID since 2014. Westminster's International Development Committee, which includes in its numbers Margaret McCulloch's friend in the No campaign, Michael McCann, concluded in one of its inquiries that the number of DFID staff in East Kilbride will decline from 2014. And then we got on to Mr McCann himself. He has been asking parliamentary questions about DFID for quite a while now. A recent one. He said... I warned that the UK government had drawn up secret plans to axe a third of the workforce at the Department for International Development in East Kilbride. The UK government is sacrificing staff in East Kilbride in order to protect the department's London HQ. So, as I say, the threat to jobs in Diffid in East Kilbride is coming from the UK government, and yet again, we have a Labour Party which is more than happy to tell one story down the road yep. and tell another up here because what's more important to them is that they try and do down the SNP, try and do down the Yes campaign and to do that they will even cover up for what Tories and Lib Dems are doing. Absolutely. I find that absolutely appalling. And the other thing that the, the motion quotes is the stuff from, from Mr Dave Fish, who I met uh, some years ago and had a lot of respect for, but he's been writing for the Better Together campaign on their website. He's entitled to, but I think there's a lot of holes can be picked in what he's saying. And one of them particularly is about the fragmentation um, of aid. When you look at the evidence that is given by the NGOs in Scotland, when you look at the evidence that is given by many respected people who have been working in international development for years, it does not matter what size an aid programme is, it's how effective it will be. And let's face it, the Contribution to Development Index, which ranks overall contributions and effectiveness to development, has the UK in eighth place. The top three are Denmark, Sweden and Norway, yep. small independent countries that work together to put out good international aid. So again, are we hearing from Margaret McCulloch that the UK cares so much about international aid and poverty worldwide that it would refuse to work with its nearest neighbour, Scotland, to make sure that countries in poverty were getting the best deal? I'll end here, presiding officer. I want Scotland to be independent. I want our international development budget to be part of a wider international strategy. That means no illegal wars that the Labour Party took yeah. us into. That means no locking up asylum seeker families that the Labour Party yeah. took us into and that the Lib Dems and the Tories have carried on. That's how we can be a real transformation to poverty and development and fairness in our world. Many. And I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Mark Macdonald. Uh, Presiding officer, I'd like to congratulate Margaret McCulloch on bringing forward this important uh, motion and also commend uh, her, her concern for jobs uh, in her uh, constituency. I think it's not terribly well known throughout Scotland, uh, obviously, as an East Kilbride, how many uh, different jobs there are uh, in East Kilbride, nearly half uh, of all the UK uh, different uh, jobs. And I think that is a fact that should be publicised to everyone in Scotland. And I can certainly understand Margaret McCulloch's uh, concern uh, for these jobs, particularly for the individuals involved. But clearly, her motion points out uh, the, the massive contribution it makes to uh, the local economy more generally. Now, I hear what Linda Fabiani has said. Clearly, there are a lot of promises in the white paper. If there's a yes vote, uh, some of us uh, have been saying, well, they can't all be delivered. So if it came to a yes, I hope that particular promise would be. But I think it's a simple fact that every promise in the white paper could not possibly uh, be delivered uh, any time soon after a yes vote, just because of the, the fiscal difficulties of an independent uh, Scotland. And certainly, Margaret McCulloch is absolutely right to say that these jobs certainly wouldn't stay uh, as, uh, as UK government jobs in the avoid of a yes uh, vote. And Dave Fish, who has been referred to by both uh, previous speakers, if I can give his full quote on that, the suggestion that the UK would continue to employ hundreds of people in what would be a foreign country is simply not credible. I mean, that just seems to me to be an obvious statement uh, of fact. 
Uh, and another interesting comment he made, just to move on from the, the jobs issue to the wider issues, is a yes vote would massively reduce Scotland's ability to impact and influence efforts to reduce world poverty. I'm not dismissing what an independent Scotland would aspire to do, and hopefully they would be able to keep their commitment on international development, although the same ca caveat about the fiscal difficulties. And I certainly don't. Uh, I don't underrate what uh, the Scottish Government has done when all said and done. I was a member of the administration that started that, uh, that Scottish, uh, devolved Scottish dimension to international uh, development. But it's a simple fact that the UK uh, has achieved uh, remarkable things in international development. Um, transformational change has been uh, described uh, in terms of the work that they've been done. And it, it has been remarkable progress. And again, um, I'll give way. Minister Humsey, yes. I thank the member for giving way on that point. And I don't uh, take away from anything the good work that the UK government has done. I've always been fair to give them credit where credit's due. But why does he think that eight out of the 10 countries that were mentioned by his colleague Mark McCulloch in the CDI Contribution to Development Index, why do you think that eight out of 10 of those countries are small, independent countries of Scotland's size? And if they can do well, why on earth could Scotland not do well and make transformational change? Well, well I, don't, I don't take away from the contribution of small countries, and I, I indicated that hopefully an independent Scotland would do that as well. I'm, I'm just saying that they cannot, uh, in, in the nature of things, uh, have that impact that a large country like the UK can have. And I think we should praise the UK in this, um, this regard, if I can just briefly be part of political labour tripled the health budget between 1997 and 2010, but the, to the credit of the Conservative Party, they have also committed to 0.7% of GNP, which most countries in the world have haven't actually achieved. And, and, and the simple fact is the UK is the second biggest aid donor in the world. And if you remember that the top one is the US, who has a massively smaller percentage of GNP, you could legitimately argue that the UK is uh, the number one uh, aid donor in the world and has played a massive part in the development of the, the international development agenda. And it's that kind of contribution to the big debates and decisions about international development that whatever uh, small country is simply cannot uh, make. Uh, obviously, we can make a practical contribution, as other small countries can, but we cannot have that massive impact, both in terms of the policy agenda, but also in terms of the transformational change, which many people certainly uh, talk of in relation to the UK. Now, my final point picks up Linda Fabiani's point about um, international affairs more generally. And of course, we all know that the SNP like to remind us of the negative side of that. And I've been known to do that myself in relation to Iraq and one or two other issues. But there is a very positive story to tell about the UK and the international development agenda as part of that. But that leads to the conclusion that potentially on a whole range of issues, the UK can be a massive force for good in the world. And on many of these issues, the reality is an independent Scotland, while making a small contribution, would only be an observer. So let's remember the positive contribution that the UK does make and can potentially make uh, for decades to come. And let's not throw that away. Thank you very much. And I now call on Mark Macdonald to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, President Officer. And I begin by apologising. I will have to leave at the end of my speech. I won't be able to stay for the remainder of the debate. Uh, I think it's unfortunate, presiding officer, that the member's business system has been used in this way to shoehorn in this debate. Because let's be clear about this. This is entirely designed to uh, be part of the wider referendum campaign and is not in any way designed to uh, highlight local issues. In terms of the uh, points that have been raised so far, I find it very rich that we are talking about the 0.7% um, contribution to international aid budget, given that after 43 years the UK had failed to achieve that, including the time when Malcolm Chisholm himself was a minister in the UK government. They did not manage to achieve the 0.7 per cent, despite having this uh, large economy that we're told about. So I think that it's very rich to be talking in those terms. It also misses the point that 0.7% um, uh, is, the, is the target because it is talking about your uh, share of uh, your budget. It's not talking about the actual monetary terms of the budget because it recognises that economies across the world vary in size and it is about countries putting forward a specific share of their, of their economy, of their budget, to help uh, the aid budget across the world. And the idea that because Scotland's uh, economy is not of the same magnitude 
as that of the wider UK, that somehow we would be we would it would diminish our efforts towards uh, contributing to international aid and international development. I find that unfortunate. It's a very uh, neat encapsulation of the too we, too poor argument, essentially. But what we've seen and what has been highlighted by the Minister is that uh, small nations, and let's be clear, in the grand scheme of international populations, we're not actually small. We're around about mid-table when it comes to populations of countries. So I, I, I think we should be wary of always referring to ourselves as a small nation. Um, we are smaller, undoubtedly, than some of the nations of the world, but we are still capable uh, of punching above our weight in a range of areas. And I believe that international development is one such area. And I thought that what the minister who has been on the record as saying that 0.7 per cent for him is just the beginning of the aspirations that Scotland should have in terms of our contribution to international development, I think that's a pretty inspirational goal to, to set. And to seek to achieve 1 per cent in very short order, I think, is absolutely what we should be aiming to do. And one of the things that concerns me is this idea that you either have to be uh, all in or all out. You either have to be all for what the UK is doing in terms of international development, or you must be dead set against it. We on these benches are not saying that everything that the UK government is doing or has done in terms of international development is wrong. That's not what we are suggesting, nor would, nor would we seek to characterise it in those ways. But what we are saying is that an independent Scotland may choose to pursue different priorities for expenditure and different priorities in terms of how aid uh, is defined. And definition of aid is an interesting point because there is a debate currently taking place within the UK government. Uh, and indeed, um, David Cameron himself has suggested the possibility that military aid could be factored in and military uh, expenditure could be factored in to the contribution to the aid budget. And I don't think that's something that we should aspire to. The idea that, for example, arms sales to regimes could count as aid, I think is something that we should be deeply, deeply troubled by and also be very hesitant towards. And lastly, on the point around jobs. Now, I have no local interest in this. I'm not a member representing East Kilbride or Central Scotland. But what I would say is that you know, the idea that somehow we won't require one jobs and two expertise after independence is fanciful. The idea that you can say, well, the DFID budget will drop after independence because, we won't, because Scotland will, will be an independent country. Well, Scotland will have an aid budget. Scotland will have an aid budget and an international development budget and will require to fund that appropriately. So the idea that you, you, you would simply start with nothing being spent in Scotland and nobody uh, working on this in Scotland is fanciful and is uh, bordering on misleading. We are in a position where we have the opportunity to uh, put Scotland out there in the world stage to advance the values that we hold uh, and to pursue the priorities that we would have as an independent nation across the world. We can use uh, the 0.7 per cent as a starting point, and the Minister, I think, has aspirations to go further, which I share. And we can also work together, because the, the one thing that really irritates me in this, in this whole referendum debate, presiding officer, is this conflation of independence with isolationism. The idea that being independent means you only ever do stuff yourself, you don't work with others. The difference about independence is that when you work together and collaborate, you do so on your own priorities and on your own terms. That doesn't currently happen as part of the UK. If working with the rest of the UK after independence is something that we would seek to do on an, a particular issue, that's fine, we can do that. But we should also be able to take our own path and uh, lead our own way uh, in other areas as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I now call on Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Maureen Watt. Uh, Presiding officer, I welcome the debate today on the future of the Department of International Development in Scotland and thank Margaret McCulloch for tabling this motion. Can I state at the outset that I'm extremely proud of the fact that DFID is based in East Kilbride, not least because last year it provided over 43 million people in other countries with clean water, better sanitation or improved hygiene conditions and reached over 11 million people with emergency food assistance. The Chair of the House of Commons International Development Committee has acknowledged that almost half of the UK's aid programme is delivered from its headquarters in Scotland, which also contains a number of DFID senior staff. Perhaps not surprisingly, therefore, as the motion confirms, there are 600 people employed in Abercrombie House in East Kilbride. Almost 60% of this workforce live within 10 miles of the office. 
This in turn means many local businesses not only uh, benefit but have, especially in these difficult times, come to rely on having DFID's headquarters in East Kilbride. At present, Scotland can be proud as part of the UK that the international aid budget is a staggering £11.4 billion and that the United Kingdom, with a population of 60 million, is the first country to honour the commitment to spend nothing 0.7% of the gross national income on overseas development obligations. In an independent Scotland, with a population, if you'd let me make some progress, of just 5 million, this vitally important work in global development in some of the world's pu poorest countries and with some of its most vulnerable people would be adversely affected by a fall of around 1 billion in the DFID age budget. Well, Minister. 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 I thank the member for giving way. She maybe inadvertently said she seemed to suggest that the UK government was the first or the UK was the first country to meet the 0.7% target. That's not correct. Of course, small independent European countries have already met it. The UK uh, is far behind. Margaret Mitchell. I'll take your word for that, Minister, but um, it's certainly uh, the first British government to, to reach the target. I think that was confirmed earlier. Worse still, if Scotland chooses to, to separate from the rest of the UK, then the different headquarters must inevitably, inevitably relocate to south of the border, which in turn would have a devastating impact on the local economy. Here, the Scottish Government's assertion that an independent Scotland will be able to protect and maintain these 600 jobs is simply not credible. Furthermore, the future of lesser-known work that DFID supports, such as the International Citizen Service, ICS for short, would also be affected. Earlier this year, I had the privilege of meeting two young people that had volunteered for ICS when they held a photographic um, exhibition in the Parliament building. This programme helps 18 to 25 year olds from throughout the UK to volunteer overseas and gives them the opportunity to gain valuable skills and experience, regardless of their income, qualifications or work history. ICS uh, is led by VSO, Voluntary Service Overseas, but funded through DFID, which recognises the positive impact that volunteering overseas can have not only on the communities in which the organisers are involved, but also with those who volunteer. The Scottish Government's white paper is silent on whether a programme like this would continue to be funded. There is therefore a legitimate concern in the event of Scotland choosing to leave the UK, that young Scots would lose out on this, in some cases, life-changing experience and the opportunity to help make a meaningful contribution to fighting pauper, uh, poverty overseas. Presiding officer, the UK is a force for good in the world with a disproportionate amount of influence overseas for a nation its size. It makes no sense to seek to weaken this influence by fragmenting the UK and in so doing, putting at risk 600 jobs and the viability of local businesses in East Kilbride, all of whom rely on DFID HQ located there. Many thanks. And I now call on Maureen Watt to be followed by Dave Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I refer to uh, my, my conveniership of the Cross Party Group on Malawi. I too am pleased to be taking part in this debate, although perplexed as to how it qualifies as a member's debate, and know that, note that very few members have signed the motion. This motion is just the latest part of Project Fear, which Better Together are running hard with at every level of the campaign, on the doorsteps, in the media, and in here, because they have no vision of how the UK can improve the lives of Scots here at home or of those we help abroad. As others have pointed out, the workers at East Kilbride are civil servants and as such have to work in the civil service and are often uh, moved about and required to move. And as others have noted, the rest of the UK, Westminster, does not have a no compulsory redundancy policy as we do in Scotland. 
And indeed, it was stated in DFID's annual report and accounts in 2012, and I quote, the numbers of staff in both locations increased from March 2011 and it will increase in March to, to March 2013 and thereafter decline. And we know that the UK civil service jobs in Scotland as a whole have declined under successive West, UK Westminster governments. In 2005, it was 35,300 in Scotland. In 2010, 33,000. In 2014, 27,000. An almost 25% decrease, with more to come. And we know already that Scotland in no way gets its share of civil service jobs, even although successive Westminster governments have said that we will get our share, nothing happens despite the promises. So I'm sure that rather than being fearful for their future, many of the civil servants in East Kilbride relish the prospects of using their skills and flexibility in the wider context of a Scottish of Scottish international development and international affairs and indeed in other departments of a new exciting civil service. I was interested in the European and External Relations Committee's inquiry on international development where many of the witnesses highlighted the areas where Scotland can take, in, can take a leading role in international development in areas such as renewable energy or climate justice on governance or public finance management. Presiding officer, I attended the evidence-taking session of the Westminster International Development Committee on the implications of Scottish independence here in this parliament. And the very clear message which NGOs here in Scotland gave Malcolm Bruce and his other two committee colleagues was that they liked the type of international development work undertaken by the Scottish Government, even with its very limited budget. And quoting from their Westminster report, they said, many Scottish-based NGOs think that the Scottish Government is more effective than DFID in engaging with them. And that's even with DFID staff in Scotland. My experience in meeting with so many NGOs and others through my involvement with Malawi is that very many relish the prospect of 0.7% of an independent Scottish budget being spent on international development. That's been SNP policy since the beginning of the 70s and one of the main reasons why I joined the party back then. In contrast, the prospect with the union, as David Cameron has suggested and others have mentioned, is of spending international aid money on overseas military interventions and that Toby Elwood MP, the PM's envoy to NATO, has drawn up what he calls detailed proposals for Downing Street, suggesting that there is an overwhelming case for military spending to count towards the 0.7% target. Presiding officer, that fills me with horror, and I'm sure it fills many other Scots with horror too, and I'm sure it will influence many people's choice on September the 18th. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now call on David Stewart to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer, and could I congratulate uh, Margaret McCulloch for securing uh, this evening's debate and for her thoughtful opening speech. Uh, President Officer, 1997 was, of course, a crucial year for international development. Labour was swept to power in the Westminster landslide victory and were committed, of course, to a step change in both foreign aid and debt relief. The Overseas Development Administration was scrapped and replaced by the Department for International Development. The UK at the time was, of course, one of the first parliaments in the world to have a fully-fledged cabinet member for development at the heart of government. At the time, I was a young, fresh-faced backbencher, strange as that may seem now, presiding officer, and I was on the cross-party group for inter international development. And I knew the Secretary of State for International Development, Claire Short, well. She was passionate and committed to development and very well served, I may say, by my friend George Fawkes, um, who was a very able uh, deputy over the years in international development. And the success and significance of these times, of course, can be measured by what was achieved between 1997 and 2010. The last Labour government, as we've heard, uh, trebled the UK's aid budget, committed the UK 
uh, to spending 0.7 of GNI on official development assistance by 2013. But more importantly, I think, freed 28 countries from debt through debt cancellation and debt relief and untied UK aid so that developing countries were given more of a say over how to spend that aid. And other members have touched on some of the successes, provided 43 million people access to clean water, better sanitation and improved hygiene, support for over 10 million children to primary and lower secondary education, ensured that 3 million births took place safely with the help of nurses, midwives or doctors, and reached over 11 million people with emergency food assistance, and provided 45 million people with access to financial services to help them work their way out of poverty. And something that many members here would have been uh, attached to very closely, uh, the Make Poverty History campaign at the G8 in Glen Eagles, very, very important campaign. And by the time Labour left office in 2010, the OECD's Development Assistance Committee had recognised the UK as a world leader in international development. And again, I would emphasise the breadth of defence operation around the world, the regional programme in Africa, Asia and Caribbean, the support for 28 countries across Africa, Asia and the Middle East, and the humanitarian assistance... Uh, apologies, I'm really short of time. I uh, apologise to Linda Fabiani. And multilateral aid through global organisations in which the UK hits above its weight, for example, the UN, the World Bank and the World Food Programme. And in coming to this Parliament, I sustain my interest in global aid effort, and I was asked and very proud to become convener of the cross-party group on international development. I was extremely work impressed with the work that committee carried out in the past and the work this Parliament carried out, particularly triggered off by Jack McConnell and, of course, parliamentarians across the party divide to forge stronger links between Scotland and Malawi with genuine cross-party support. And at that time, the Scottish Executive's international development policy was new. But today, uh, our contribution to the developing world is even greater and our relationship with countries we partner is even stronger. It's worth reflecting on the role that DFID play in supporting the Scottish Government at that crucial time. Today, the two governments have combined aid efforts are complementary. What we've achieved, we've achieved together. Thank you. Thanks so much. I now call on Claire Adamson, after which we move the closing speech from the Minister. Presiding officer, um, normally, um, like my colleagues, I would be saying I would be pleased to speak in this debate this evening. However, on this occasion, I'm afraid that the debate that has been called by the Labour member and with the support of their Better Together partners is simply a cynical plo ploy to pour fear into the hearts of hard-working civil servants. And I take that personally. Side officer, I take it personally because my mother worked for the Inland Revenue for an entire working life and my brother has worked for the Procurator Fiscal Office for his. Both of them are PCS members and my brother has served as a shop steward for the PCS. It would be very helpful if members didn't come in brandishing copies of the white paper, but actually read the white paper and the answers and what the information that is in there. The PCS union, many of whom the members in DFID and the HMRC office, which has also been put under fear today by the UK government, the, many of them will be PCS members. And the PCS have put some key um, demands down for answers of um, people campaigning in the, uh, the independence referendum. And I won't be able to go through all of those tonight, but I think it, it's very important that we look at some of the key issues. One of the demands is to end austerity cuts. But Alistair Darling has told them, if it's a no vote, we'll have tougher and deeper cuts than those, those of Margaret Thatcher. And Ed Balls has, continued, has committed to continue the austerity agenda set by the Tories. The Scottish Government, however, in the White Paper and the early priorities for action within sound public finances says that the Government will ensure that Scotland is a stable and sustainable public finance underpinned by discipline of framework designed to ensure that Scotland's finances are appropriate for the country's economy and able with, to withstand the changes in economic circumstances. The PCS also say that public services should, be not, should, should not be for private profit. In the section on gains for independence, it states that public services can be kept in public hands, and the Scottish Parliament has the power to keep the NHS in public hands, but it could not stop other services like the Royal Main being privatised by Westminster. The direction of Westminster is a reduced public service, a reduced civil service, and we should not ignore what, what the consequences of a no vote could be. 
The PCS are also looking for us to invest in renewable energy. The White Paper states Scotland can look forward to a further energy bonus from our green energy resources with expected sales of £14 billion by 2050 from offshore. No thank you. Um, the opposite members wouldn't take uh, interventions earlier. With expected sales of £14 billion by 2050 from offshore tidal and wind energy. Could I just suggest you confine yourself to the motion? It is a very broad motion, but I don't see well, I think that the, renewable the, energy. And I am not seeking a debate, please. Well, I, I will take on board what you are saying, presiding officer, but this to me is an attack on civil service workers. Civil service workers belong to the PCS unions and this is what they want out of the independence debate. I don't think it was us that turned this into a debate about independence. Here, here. But taking on board what you've said, presiding officer, I think if we look to the final um, thing that the, the PCS have demanded, and that's the repeal of all anti-trade union laws and a charter for change of union rights. This is also in the white paper, a commitment to work with the STUC, to work with companies for board representation on boards. 18 years of a Labour government and a failure to repeal any of the anti-trade union laws that were brought in by Margaret Thatcher. Had we had a real Labour government, that might have been different. And I use that term very appropriately, because it's a term Roy Hattersley used on Radio 4 this morning to describe the Blair years and a government that did nothing to improve international relations and simply damaged the reputation of the UK and the world with its illegal wars. Our civil servants demand our support. They do an excellent work. We have an opportunity with independence to continue on the great work and the expertise that people have done. They must look to how the future may, with a no vote, impact on their jobs. Do the people in DFID want to be supporting military intervention to be included as part of that UN target that is the one of the current Tory government? We have a choice of two futures. One that has commitments, one that answers the questions that the PCS and civil service are demanding in the white paper, and one that leads us down Tory cuts, Tory austerity, and in continuation of threats to the civil service in Scotland. Now I call on Minister Humza Yusuf to close the debate on behalf of the government. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, what we see in this uh, motion and from the opening speech by the member was nothing but an exercise in scaremongering, fear baiting and the politics of cynicism all rolled into one. But it does, if nothing else, give me the opportunity to offer my assurances and reassurances once again and commitments that the Scottish Government has given in, re in relation to the UK Government's Department for International Development. I've previously said in this Parliament, I think everywhere I've spoken on the public record, uh, people will be able to see that I've given fair credit to DFID for the good work that they do. I've also met the staff who work in Abercrombie House on a number of occasions at a number of different events. There's absolutely no question in my mind as to their commitment to the cause of international development. Uh, my concern has always been, of course, for much of that good work that they have done, even when they haven't met the 0.7% target, much of that good work has indeed been undermined by UK government's other policies, foreign affairs uh, or trade. And some of those were mentioned, uh, be it arms and defence sales to uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, Robert Mugabe, uh, General Suharto, Argentinian military junta, uh, just to name a few, or indeed uh, if it's been foreign policies like the illegal invasion of Iraq that was mentioned by me uh, members during the debate. Uh, so we have offered reassurances uh, in terms of uh, jobs to, to DFID. In fact, I offered those reassurances when I met the or was questioned by the Westminster Select Committee inquiry on the future of development in the event of independence. Uh, when they came to Scotland, I said, and I reiterate again here, that we would work with the UK government to preserve continuity of employment of all civil service jobs in Scotland. We've said that before in terms of defence jobs, other jobs that are reserve functions, and we say it again in regards to those 604 jobs that are in DFID in East Cobride, they make a massive contribution. I don't doubt that for a second. But their expertise is a great asset to a future Scottish international development, and indeed even an external affairs function. They would be a brilliant asset. Uh, Margaret McCulloch said that they wouldn't be the same size. She questioned in New Ireland's example. The problem is when you're comparing like with like, you must compare, of course, countries that have the same ambition that an international development function 
in Scotland would have. We have said very clearly in our white paper that she has there on her desk, if she wishes to open it, that we have committed to at least 0.7 per cent, aspirationally going beyond that. If you look at countries that are population the size of Scotland, like Denmark, have a population of 5.59 million, uh, meet the 0.7 per cent target, in fact exceed it, uh, their number in terms of their international development and external affairs staff make 846. Sweden has a population of 9.52 million. Yes, of course, uh, bigger than Scotland, but still under that 10 million bracket. They have 735 staff uh, that is because they meet that 0.7% target. So when you look at countries that have the ambition that Scotland uh, has and that the scale that Scotland does, actually, uh, we could well maintain those jobs. But not only would we be able to maintain and continue the employment of those jobs, uh, yes, just in this final point, but also not only would we be able to continue that, but, of course, other opportunities would be available in an external affairs function as well. I'll give way to the member. Uh, well, I don't uh, doubt the sincerity of, of what he hopes to do and, and the assertions he's made. The difference is that, at present, we don't know what currency an independent Scotland would have. We don't know the start-up costs. We've got fluctuating oil prices and we've got a defence policy which sees the loss of thousands of jobs. With that um, tally of uncertainties, then I don't think it's credible that the 600 jobs or the nothing point seven would be protected. Minister, I mean, I, I wouldn't go into setup costs. I mean, I have here, of course, the 12 times the figure the UK government came up when it came up with setup costs. Of course, Patrick Dunleavy, Professor Patrick Dunleavy's figure of 150 to 200 million for startup costs was well rehearsed, but also it was mentioned, of course, that those would be recouped through efficiency savings. And the uncertainty is exactly what I want to come on to, because although we've uh, preserved, uh, said that we would preserve continuity of employment, uh, and further cemented that by saying we have a policy, of course, that members are aware of, of no compulsory redundancies, no such commitment is forthcoming from the UK government. Uh, that is where the uncertainty to jobs for DFID lies. In fact, even opposition parties, those in the Labour opposition, they have not committed to no compulsory redundancies. Ed Balls has not, uh, has not committed to no compulsory redundancies. In fact, if he has, please do intervene and tell me otherwise. Well, I didn't think so. So, look, when it comes to the threat from jobs at DFID, uh, that comes from the UK government. I'm going to read some of the quotes from Margaret McCulloch's good friend, uh, Michael McCann, MP. He says, I've also made it clear that compulsory redundancies should be avoided at all costs, without, of course, uh, realising his party hasn't uh, quite committed to that. I've asked the Minister to keep me updated with any developments. It seems to me, and I quote, that the government isn't doing all it can to protect British jobs. Her very good friend Michael McCann again says, Today my worst fears have come to pass, despite the Department's previous denials. Staff in Difford were called to a meeting and told in excess of 140 jobs will go. But more than that, he owes it to the staff of Difford to reverse this crazy decision. So she doesn't believe me. Maybe she'll believe her very good friend, uh, Michael McCann, MP. And if she doesn't believe her very good friend, Michael McCann, MP, perhaps she will, as other members have done, look at Difford's own accounts that were examined and scrutinised by the International Development Select Committee. They say very clearly that there will be a reduction in staff. And they show very clearly by this graph that there will be a reduction in Difford staff in 2014-2015. So the threat to jobs doesn't come from a yes vote. It comes from staying within uh, the status quo. Uh, the Scottish Government has a very ambitious vision of the role that Scotland can play as a good global citizen, as well as, of course, committing to that 0.7% target, which the UK has finally. And again, I've been fair in commending the UK Government for doing that and eventually getting there. And it took us a Conservative Government, of course, to get there. In fact, in Margaret Mitchell's own motion, she uses the words, at last, the UK government has at last uh, reached that target. Uh, it's important to realise that that's £87.5 billion pounds of missing aid. Uh, for those 43 years that have been missed, £87.5 billion pounds of missing aid. That's not something uh, to be proud of. But look at those countries that have reached that target. In the 1970s, Sweden was the first to meet the target in 74. In 1975, it was the Netherlands. In 1976, it was Norway. In 1978, it was Denmark. And all four countries have consistently met it. What do those four countries have in common? Of course, they are small, independent European nations. And when Malcolm Chisholm says that there's no way that Scotland could have the same impact as the UK, almost uh, questioning the audacity of Scotland to even think that they could have the same impact as the rest of the UK. My point is a very simple one. Look at the contribution 
to development by the CDI, the index that was mentioned by his own member in her opening remark. And when you look at that, uh, yes, the UK commendable in eighth position, but of course the other nine out of ten in that are small, independent nations. That doesn't rank the size in monetary terms. It ranks their impact, their contribution, and what they've been able to be able to have achieved in, in, on the world stage in tackling poverty. So to end, presiding officer, our vision for international development is uh, beyond and uh, above and beyond. Uh, indeed, what, uh, what uh, other members here have suggested that a small country should look to do. We want to legislate for that 0.7 per cent, but we want to do aid better. And of course, we'll work with the UK government in the future to do that, and any government that wishes to do that. But I am disappointed uh, that a member's debate is distasteful and a motion is distasteful. This, uh, of course, uh, has been used to scare uh, those in uh, civil servants that are hardworking. Uh, across the country. And let me give an absolute assurance once again that in the case of a vote for independence that we will preserve continuity of employment for not just DFID staff but civil servants, hard-working civil servants across the country. Many thanks. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. Thank you all.